Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to Conversations About Carbon. Uh, this is a monthly series uh, hosted by the ISU Bioeconomy Institute, as well as the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jim Jordahl. I'm on Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore's staff here at the Bioeconomy Institute. The goal of conversations about carbon is to bring people together for an informal discussion around concepts of carbon reduction and removal, and to discuss the role that agriculture can play as a climate uh, change solution. Opportunities and challenges in carbon reduction and removal are unfamiliar to a lot of people. So we want this to be educational and to give you an opportunity to talk with experts and, and leaders in this field. Uh, we definitely want audience engagement. I'll spend the first bit of time here getting uh, Alejandro going with some initial questions, but uh, we very much welcome you to share your questions in the chat, uh, which I'll moderate and, uh, and share with Alejandro uh, later on. Overall, our session will be about 45 minutes. I'll spend the first 15 or 20 with my initial questions and then open it up uh, to your questions uh, submitted via the chat. And now I, my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Alejandro Plastina, who's an associate professor and extension economist in the Department of Economics here at Iowa State University. His area of specialization is agricultural production and technology with an emphasis on farm business and financial management. His research focuses on the socioeconomic drivers of conservation practices, voluntary pest resistance management, and agricultural uh, productivity. Alejandro has also authored numerous research and extension publications on carbon programs and carbon markets, which of course is our topic for today. He's received numerous awards for his work, including the 2022 Dean's Citation for Extraordinary Contributions to the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at Iowa State. And so um, with that, I'd like to welcome Alejandro and kind of kick things off with a quick 101. What exactly is a carbon market and why do we sometimes hear it called a, a voluntary market? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Jim, for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to have this discussion. Hopefully it's a, an engaging discussion for the audience also. Um, so addressing your question about what is a carbon market? Well, uh, it should be, in terms of market definitions, a, a gathering of um, buyers and sellers of carbon credits, um, and where basically the price for carbon credits are determined. Now, we usually hear voluntary carbon markets um, to emphasize the fact that the trade or exchange of these carbon credits for monetary values are associated with a number of entities pledging carbon neutrality. And that is um, can be compared against the other type of carbon markets, the mandatory uh, or compliance type of carbon markets where there are uh, certain agencies, governmental agencies um, defining what Mark what players in a specific industry can do in terms of emissions. So they set up a stipulated amount of allowances for each player in the industry, uh, let's say a large power plants, for example, and um, they distribute those allowances on an annual basis. And if a, if a particular um, power plant goes beyond the allowance in terms of emissions, well, that power plant will need to either buy unused carbon allowances from other power plants in the system or buy carbon offsets from other industries to compensate for their excess emissions in any particular e year. So those are mandatory or uh, compliance carbon markets. And we have a number of them in the US, uh, the largest being the RGGI, um, the Regional Gas Initiative, Greenhouse Gas Initiative in, um, in the northeastern part of the country with 11 states associated to it and uh, the California cap and trade system um, for power plants, basically. Okay, great. Th thank you. It sounds like a fascinating space and very complicated to uh, keep up to speed with. Um, I understand some form of a carbon market has been around for a long time. And in brief, can you kind of 
uh, tell us about the history of, of these markets that brought us to where we are today and, and maybe why is there just so much discussion of this uh, recently? Yeah, so um, you're right the, the um, carbon trading has been around since the Kyoto Protocol was uh, implemented in 2005. Kyoto Protocol was an agreement between uh, 37 countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 5% uh, by 2012 compared to 1990 levels. Uh, and that, although that particular, the Kyoto Protocol was not adopted by the US, um, it established the rules of the game, let's say, to trade carbon credits, uh, specifically with the development of the, um, with the introduction of the clean development mechanism. So one nation could invest in another nation um, in a specific project in another nation to generate carbon credits and use those credits to sell them um, outside of the country where they were generated. So that was a new um, innovation that allowed a trading of carbon credits. But that's not the only one. I, I would say that's the, the earliest form of uh, um, carbon credit trading. Uh, in 2005, the European Union created the EU emission trading system to implement basically the Kyoto, basically the Kyoto Protocol in the European Union. Um, and uh, they are now the largest emission trading system in the world, uh, trading about 5% of all global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In the US, in 2003, we had the first um, voluntary greenhouse gas emissions cap and trade program, um, the Chicago Climate Exchange, um, that was short-lived um, because participants uh, voluntarily chose to participate, but once they were in the system, they had to abide by the rules set by the uh, Chicago Climate Exchange. Uh, so they had to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions through time um, and uh, to cover, you know, excess emissions, of course, um, carbon credits were traded in that program. Um, the thing is, the way the allowances were set up at the beginning was too lax and the companies were able to maintain their emissions below their allowance levels throughout the, well, throughout the years. So there was nothing or there wasn't much to trade. And eventually that Chicago Climate Exchange um, disappeared and just uh, didn't have any uh, liquidity at all. Um, more recently we had in, in 2005, <clears throat> the RGGI as I described in the Northeastern part of the country um, where the goal is to um, reduce or maintain, you know, basically reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from large fossil fuel uh, power plants. Uh, and in uh, 2013, California introduced the uh, cap and trade system to maintain uh, a, a declining number of allowances for um, power plants, the industrial sector and the uh, transportation sectors. So there's a, there's a history of different programs. Um, internationally and domestically. Um, most of them uh, have been um, compliance programs, you know, set up by some governmental agency. Uh, right now there are 70 different um, pricing schemes, compliance pricing schemes around the world. And some of them include uh, carbon taxes and some of them are uh, emission trading systems with cap and trade type of, of trading. Um, but agricultural carbon um, credits are actually a small fraction of all the credits traded in those systems. In some of them, they don't even allow um, offsets from agricultural, from the agricultural sector to be used to offset uh, emissions in those cap and trade systems. And when they do, there are multiple um, layers to the legislation or, or the regulations that, um, first of all, put a very strict limit on the amount of 
offsets that can be used by the participating entities in a cap and trade program to um, offset uh, excess emissions. Um, so uh, they are more flexible in general when it comes to buying unused emission allowances from other similar power plants in the system, for example, but it's uh, much harder for the power plants to actually offset their emissions through carbon offsets generated in other industries like agriculture. So in general, agriculture plays a minuscule role in, um, in, offset, in offsetting emissions on, in those cap and trade systems. And when they, when there are um, carbon credits from the ag sector traded in, in those cap and trade systems, they are mostly from um, the livestock sector. So uh, methane capture and, and destruction mostly. Um, and we hear now and more and more about these voluntary carbon farming programs uh, because now with the um, growing number of entities, large corporations mostly, uh, making these pledges to become carbon neutral at some point in the future. Um, well, the, the, a, a certainly a cost-effective way to uh, start doing something about that carbon neutrality is to offset current emissions, um, you know, while the technology, the lower emission technology is being developed and it, it becomes economically viable for these corporations to adopt the new technology. In the meantime, a cost-effective way to reduce the environmental impact of their um, business practices is to buy offsets from different sectors. And agriculture is one of the few sectors that with the existing technology can provide carbon credits into these voluntary systems. Oh, okay. Um, when we talk about the phrase carbon market, um, Iowa farmers are very familiar with grain and livestock markets, Chicago Board of Trade, and, and so forth. Um, are these like that? Are they publicly traded? Or how, do, how is it a, a market, so to speak? Well, that's an interesting question, because we are very familiar with uh, um, trading number two yellow corn, for example. It's a very clear standard of what's expected uh, in, in that trade and there are um, scales to measure uh, production or, or trade in all elevators people trust those scales and they're they are pretty homogeneous in and, and robust they produce robust measurements of um, of um, the number of bushels and uh, traded right um, well, we don't have anything like that right now in, in, uh, with carbon credits. Um, each carbon farming program, that is those um, intermediaries who organize the interaction between the supply and demand of carbon credits, and there are many big names out there, Indigo Ag, ESMC, Nori, um, Soil and Water Outcomes Fund, you name it. There are multiple carbon programs. These carbon programs use different scales to uh, measure how much carbon is sequestered or removed from the atmosphere by a specific change in practices, let's say by implementing cover, crop, uh, cover crops in, in one farm. Um, so until we have a more homogeneous system to measure how much carbon is removed by one particular conservation practice in one particular farm, um, we, we lack that kind of well-respected and well-known scale to measure um, the or to quantify how much carbon is removed or sequestered through agricultural practices. That being said, there are effort, ongoing efforts to actually um, homogenize or standardize or come to an agreement on the guidelines that should be followed 
to um, to do that measurement. And it's not just measurement, it's the measurement reporting and verification that is really valuable um, to provide credibility to any traded carbon credit. And, uh, and the, the value of carbon credits, of course, is associated to the credibility uh, of, uh, of those carbon credits. Uh, now, are they publicly traded? Well, there are, there are a few, I know of two uh, nearby futures contract um, offered by the CME group that allow for the trading um, a very specific type of carbon credit. So it has to do with uh, carbon credits issued by specific registries and uh, that on top of that, they qualify for certain um, uh, additional certifications. For example, there's one um, that requires Corsia um, um, certification and the other one requires a uh, climate uh, specific climate um, community and biodiversity standards certification. So the, they are very, very specific. The thing is, since they are so specific, um, they are trying to reach very high standards of quality um, and credibility. The liquidity is really thin. And that is, there's not much volume in the trade of those particular futures contracts. So they are, they cannot be used to, um, to um, discover prices for, for carbon credits. They are very, very specific. Um. Kind of focusing on the, the past year or, or so, is there any particular evolution of the carbon programs most relevant to Iowa agriculture that, that, you've, that you've noticed? Um, yes, there are several. Uh, it's a very dynamic space. So there mm -hmm. uh, things are changing on, on a weekly basis, right? Um, so we have new carbon farming programs coming up online by you know um, created by new companies uh, um, and new carbon programs being developed by existing companies and some carbon programs are exiting the market already um, so as i say it's a very dynamic uh, situation in terms of um, major changes and, and impactful changes i think there are two major trends that are relevant. One is the attempt to find uh, generally accepted guidelines on how to uh, standardize these carbon credits. Uh, and there are both private efforts to do that, but also now with the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022 that was signed into law as of December 29th, 2022. Um, I'm sorry, it's the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2023. Um, that that uh, law actually um, uh, requests that the USDA conducts a specific analysis to assess the need for a program to address this carbon, carbon uh, market or carbon credit trading. Uh, and it's not about setting up a public marketplace. That's not the case. In fact, the, the law prohibits that. Um, but the idea is that um, the USDA secretary um, could establish an advisory council made of farmers, uh, researchers, industry specialists, and uh, registries and so on to basically standardize the or, or to come to an agreement on what protocols are acceptable um, from the consumer's perspective and uh, what practices are attainable by farmers um, and uh, come to some uh, recommendations on, on the guidelines on how to standardize that um, those rules um, the measurement reporting and verification rules, basically, and they, <clears throat> sorry, they would also create basically a 
this uh, if it goes in into effect this program would create a phone book of um, technical assistance providers and third party verifiers um, you know the, so the USDA would establish some minimum requirements to serve a technical provider or third party verifier for these carbon programs and uh, as long as um, as uh, people or entities comply with those requirements, then they could be included in that big phone book, basically. So I think that is one major change that uh, could have a real impact in fostering the growth of these uh, initiatives and eventually create a functioning carbon market. Right now, I don't think we have a, a, a well-functioning carbon market because most trades are bilateral. There's no clear, transparent information for the public on what's going on there. Uh, but that could change if, um, if um, the USDA implements this program. Um, so both from the private and the public perspective, I think there's um, there are trends that push for growth in, in this sector. There's more, more and more companies are pledging to become carbon neutral. Um, they are searching for carbon credits to offset their own carbon emissions or scope one emissions and the emissions throughout their value chain or scope three emissions. We call that sometimes insets. Um, so uh, particularly with the, the pass of that, that law, the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm much more optimistic about the future of carbon markets uh, over the next decade than what I was prior to that law. Okay, great. Um, kind of switching to, to a couple of things from the, the chat um, or Q&A function. Um, one question is, are there some examples of historical voluntary markets that, that have worked well? What would be a, a good analogy that of a functioning voluntary market? Uh, great question. Um, so in the carbon space, I don't, I'm not familiar with any example. Now in the organic market space, um, organic milk, organic food, and so on, um, there, there used to be a number of, well, the whole market is based on voluntary uh, pricing, right? So um, consumers pay for organic milk at premium uh, when we compare that to non-organic milk. Um, and that premium is determined by supply and demand. So there's no government involvement in supporting organic prices. So that's a case where um, a voluntary market actually developed um, based on a credence attribute, something that people, we cannot really tell whether the milk is organic by just drinking that milk. There has to be a certification in place that we trust as consumers in order to be willing to pay that premium. Well, that could happen if this advisory committee or council is put in place by the USDA secretary and uh, a, a more robust set of guidelines is developed to, um, to provide credibility to the measurement reporting and verification system behind uh, carbon credits, uh, particularly carbon credits from agriculture, right? So uh, just like with the organic market, there used to be prior to the, the uh, creation of the USDA organic label, there used to be hundreds of different uh, local and minor um, uh, organic label, labels. Um, well, uh, they didn't do very well. It, it was a very local, very segmented. There, there was no liquidity in financing organic producers because lenders wouldn't um, we're unsure about the, the prospects of an organic market based on a private organic label, um, but that changed when the USDA actually introduced the USDA organic label, um, 
and because that gave credibility to the entire organic system. Um, so there are still private organic labels um, or other attributes uh, that go in the label on top of the USD organic, but um, most of con most of uh, consumers would uh, trust to a certain extent the USDA organic label, and that provides a clear signal that there are high chances that the product that you are paying a premium for as a consumer was actually produced following organic practices. That could really, if we can have something like that happen in um, with um, uh, carbon farming, with generation and, and trade of carbon credits from agriculture, then I think that could provide a big push for uh, the more interest both, both from farmers and consumers on actually growing the market and make it, making it a, a more transparent and more, um, uh, more a stronger market, basically, more liquid. Um, getting uh, more questions popping up in, in the chat and I encourage those to, to keep coming. Um, um, was there a, a, a timeline for that uh, USDA uh, yes. process of standardization, Alejandro? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. The, the, the law says that the, US, um, the USDA secretary has to determine whether such program is needed or valuable by uh, early October 2023. And at that point in time, if there's a positive conclusion uh, to that argument, then the next step is to create this um, advisory council that would create um, the guidelines to define who can get into the phone book and who cannot, basically. So it will start in October 2023. If it starts, it will start in October 2020. Okay, so still some uncertainty there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question about um, um, companies' actions and the value of, of carbon credits, um, pricing going up or down. Um, you think those credits will go become more valuable in the future based on what companies do or don't do in investing in the market? So I'm, I'm uh, okay. So from supply and demand, um, the basic response would be um, the number of companies and entities interested in buying carbon credits is growing um, because of the pledges they they uh, they communicated to their stakeholders, investors, and consumers. The thing is, will they? abide by those pledges after all they are promises um, then will they prefer carbon credits from agriculture or for from forestry or from other sectors like industrial um, carbon sequestration uh, and storage or maybe carbon credits from renewable energy um, those are questions that we don't have an answer to. Um, I would say if demand grows uh, large enough, then there will be demand for also for uh, every subsector. Um, but uh, agriculture is not the only provider of uh, or the only potential provider of these carbon credits. Uh, in fact, forestry and renewable energy are the major uh, suppliers of carbon credits today around the world. Um, but my intuition is that there should be, we could expect a, an increase in demand for agricultural carbon credits. Yes. I think there was an element of that uh, chat question that I missed in terms of would it be in the company's interest to try and drive the value of these credits down or could they even do so um, trying to keep the prices low? Well, the, the one way to, to, to do that is simply not buying carbon credits. Uh, and oh, okay. I would, would take them you know, um, out of their set path 
to achieve their carbon neutrality goals. Um, so that's why I emphasize that those are just pledges, promises. Um, we want to believe that these large corporations will not be making, uh, you know, empty promises. Um, but the the timing of the changes that they introduce to actually achieve their carbon neutrality by 2040 or by 2050 uh, will really impact the demand for carbon credits. Um, you mentioned that the ag industry has a great potential to provide these, these carbon offsets. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chat question is asking about what are some of the different practices or new solutions that might uh, offset these, these emissions? What kind of things are we talking about? Yeah, yeah, great question. So there are a number of um, conservation practices or regenerative practices that uh, could that sequester carbon or remove carbon from the atmosphere. Um, the most common ones in, in terms of what these carbon farming programs are, are using um, are basically uh, adding cover crops um, to annual uh, crop production, uh, switching or reducing the tillage intensity uh, of um, crop production, um, using um, conservation covers uh, in, um, in fruit production, um, reducing the stocking rates on pastures, uh, um, planting trees, um, uh, planting pastures, um, and reducing the rate of uh, fertilizer application. Um, and those are just some of the practices. But the top two practices, the most common ones, are mm, reducing tillage intensity and other adding cover crops. Now. Having said that, it's important to highlight that in order for those practices to actually be accounted in the calculation of um, carbon credit generation, they have to be additional. So if a farmer has been doing cover crops and no-till for 10 years in a particular farm, well, that farm will not be um, eligible to participate in these carbon farming programs. Uh, additionality is a major concept, a major requirement right now to participate in, in these carbon farming programs. The other one is permanence. Um, what's a ballpark uh, dollar per ton uh, right now that a voluntary buyer would have uh, paid uh, in the past few months. So what are these credits going for? That, that's a great question. And the honest answer is, I don't know, because those are um, bilateral trades between the, the, the carbon farming program and the buyer, usually. Um, a, the only publicly available uh, price is that uh, available in the Nori marketplace, so nori.com. Anyone can go and buy a carbon credit or the equivalent of a carbon credit, a Nori removal token or, or NRT um, for $20 plus a fee uh, right now. But um, that's, that's not what farmers are paid to actually implement the practices. Um, that's a trade between the buyer and usually the carbon farming program. Um, how much farmers are paid in that space, I do have some uh, better idea of uh, the prices paid. And there are two, basically two types of approaches. Um, a few carbon farming programs offer farmers payments per practice per acre. So um, let's say about $6 to implement no-till um, per $6 per acre per year to implement no-till, uh, $6 per acre per year to adopt cover crops. And in that sense, in, in that type of program, 
the farmer is not paid per output, that is how much carbon is sequestered in their field, but just per practices. The other approach is to pay farmers by output, by an estimated amount of carbon removed from the atmosphere uh, through specific agricultural practices like adding uh, cover crops or switching to no-till. Um, in that case, the price paid is on a per metric ton, is, is in, in dollars per metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent removed from the atmosphere. Uh, so it's not just uh, a calculation of how much soil organic carbon is uh, in the soil, but it includes nitrous oxide emission in the calculation, methane emissions, and so on, and everything is transformed into carbon dioxide equivalent units. How much farmers are paid um, to participate in those type of carbon farming programs? It varies, uh, but I would say the range today is um, between 20 and, and 35 dollars per um, per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Okay. Um, great. There's a related question, kind of kind of blending. I think maybe the uh, compliance market versus the voluntary market, or uh, payments for cover crops versus uh, like maybe something from uh, anaerobic digesters, the renewable natural gas uh, side of, of things, any cost comparison of, of how that's working per, per ton or any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm less familiar, uh, honestly, with uh, those practices, but um, methane, um, methane uh, sequestration and, and uh, met, sorry, methane capture and destruction, for example, um, is a, uh, usually carries higher prices because they are, the, it's an industrial process and industrial processes have, um, can be measured more accurately at the lower cost and uh, uh, than agriculture, mm -hmm. that, that, that carbon sequestration through agricultural practices, um, basically you can put a gauge in, in, one, um, in one pipe and uh, you, you can uh, measure how much methane was removed from the atmosphere. Um, and those credits usually trade for higher prices than, um, than credits from agricultural practices. And some of them are even eligible to, um, to participate in the compliance markets, like in the California cap and trade or the RGGI system. Um, so if they qualify to participate in, in those um, compliance uh, emission trading systems, they usually trade for much higher prices. Um, yeah, it can be 60 to $100. Okay. Yeah. Um, a series of really great questions here in, in, in the chat. Um, is the value of carbon credits influenced at all by these uh, ESG uh, reports or uh, here they call it investment funds, but relationship of the ESG reports to, to these credits and programs? I think it really, uh, the ESG reports um, are one way of communicating, are one way for corporations or publicly traded companies to actually tell investors what they are doing to improve their um, environmental profile or reduce their uh, environmental footprint, right? So these net zero pledges or carbon neutrality pledges, I think they are deeply rooted in the intent of, of companies uh, to, to attract more environmentally conscious um, investors and stakeholders and and consumers, um, but that's my 
economist perspective, right? Um, but I think that, that there, there, there is an indirect relation between ESG reports, demand for carbon offsets or insets, and the, the larger the demand for carbon offsets and insets, the typically the, the higher the price paid to, to farmers or those who produce the offsets and insets. I think we have time for uh, one, one more uh, quick uh, question here. Uh, um, do you see carbon credits as perishable? Um, hmm. or, um, like milk are due to the connection of a certain vintage of the reduction or the removal when, when the reduction happens and when the credits are traded, just the, the, the timing of, of things. Can you explain that just quickly? Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question. And uh, uh, there are some studies out there proposing the this idea of annualizing the um, the amount of carbon sequestration. So right now, most of the discussion of most of this trade um, is based on the idea of permanent carbon removal. So mm -hmm. some, some programs have a baseline of 100 years of um, carbon that is sequestered for 100 years, some others for 20 years, some others for 10, and, and so on. But the idea is that the more permanent the carbon sequestration, the more valuable the credit should be, right? Um, and uh, there's this um, this uh, research, recent research, discussing the comparable effects of a small carbon sequestration that is permanent, let's say over 100 years, versus a large carbon sequestration occurring in one year. Um, and there are some factors, you know, um, biophysical factors and, and economic factors that could be used to compare the two. What are the their impacts in the environment? Because there's some decay of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so their impact is lower as, 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 as time goes by. Um, so what are the biophysical and economic factors that could be used to change the discussion from permanent carbon sequestration to annual amounts of carbon sequestration? But it's very um, uh, green, it's, it's in, in its infancy um, and, and still most um, carbon programs put a premium on um, ensuring the permanence of their carbon sequestration. So much so that some carbon programs um, keep buffers or, um, or reserve pools of carbon credits that, that were generated by, let's say, farmers in the program, but they don't sell a portion of those credits um, they keep it in these pools just in case some unforeseen event would generate a carbon reversal. That is, you know, uh, something will can happen that will put back some uh, of the carbon sequestered uh, in the program back into the atmosphere. For example, in a 10-year contract um, to implement a no-till in a farm, let's say near six or seven, there's a weed infestation that cannot be treated chemi chemically. Uh, so you need to till uh, in order to produce something in that field. And uh, well, by tilling the field, the farmer would put back into the atmosphere a big share of the carbon sequester in the previous five, six, seven years. So uh, that's a carbon reversal. So carbon programs are creating these buffers or reserve pools to address those carbon reversals and maintain the permanence of um, carbon credits from agriculture. Well, um, unfortunately, um, we've run out of time. We've got uh, several more questions in the chat we're not going to get to, um, but definitely a lot of interest in this area. I would like to uh, thank you so much, Alejandro, for sharing your expertise. Yay. My pleasure. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and uh, answer all these questions. Uh, this was just great. Um, um, 
we've been hearing a lot of questions on this topic, and I think we have a lot of work to do uh, to continue to, to track this area and do additional research and, and extension. And uh, thank you again, Alejandro. Um, that was great. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Kalina. Any uh, closing uh, comments uh, before we uh, uh, finish here? Yes, thank you all for attending today's session. Our next conversation about carbon will be on March 22nd. Uh, due to spring break, we are pushing it back a week. So please make sure that you join us on the 22nd of March for the next one.